But if you find anyone who has your gods, he shall not live. In the presence of our relatives, see for yourself whether there is anything of yours here with me. And if so, take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the gods. Now he really loves Rachel, and he's made a promise, and it would have been carried out. There's no doubt about it. If, if uh, this turned out wrong, Rachel would have forfeit her life. But um, why would he say to take, you would have taken my wives by force? It's because he's in the land of his uncle, and his uncle has all of his family, all of his friends, and they could have done that. They, you know, they're not to be trusted to begin with, so he decided it was best to just sneak out secretly. And now he's far enough away from Laban where Laban can't take him by force because he only has, you know, probably his clan, and it's Jacob's clan against his, and it would have just been a, a, probably a bloody mess. Plus, God rebuked Laban. Go ahead. So Laban went into Jacob's tent, and into Leah's tent, and into the tent of the two maidservants, but he found nothing. After he came out of Leah's tent, he entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household gods, and put them inside her camel's saddle, and was sitting on them. Yeah. Laban searched through everything in the tent, but found nothing. Cool. Rachel said to her father, Don't be angry, my lord, that I cannot stand up in your presence. I'm having my period. <laughs> So he searched, but could not find the household god. Okay, so and you know, back then, I, you know, nowadays it's not a big thing, but back then, if a woman was on her period, she was isolated. Okay, and we're going to see that also in the law of uh, Leviticus. We're going to see that, but um, you know, it, it was just one of those things that, uh, you know, now we just don't treat it the same way nowadays. But back then, that was, you know, it was just one of those things, and he would have been like, eh, I'm not touching anything over, you know. And plus, he would never expect his daughter to claim she's on a period sitting on the idol. So, so it was a smart thing for her to do, even if she wasn't telling the truth, which we have no idea. It doesn't say one way or another, but she's sitting on this, claiming it, and he's certainly not going to get near that. So, hmm. Okay. Jacob was angry and took Laban to task. What is my crime? He asked Laban. What sin have I committed that you hunt me down? Now that you have searched through all my goods, what have you found that belongs to your household? Put it here in front of your relatives and mine, and let them judge between the two of us. All right, so, you know, he's, he's saying, listen, I didn't do it, and he obviously has no idea about this. We, we can't say for certain, but I would think that he is just completely unaware of this, and uh, we're going to find out a little later. What's that? It said that he was unaware. Oh, that's right, he was. That's right. Okay, it did. But later he's going to find out about it. I got my head screwed off for a second there, but you're right, it did say that. And then it says, um, bring these uh, brethren here that they may judge between us both. Well, the word judge, I'm sure, is Dan there, you know, just what the names of one of the sons. But I, I don't know that I could pull it out and tell you, but I'm sure that's what he's saying. Anyway, go ahead, 39. I have been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flock. Okay, so it was. It was six years that he worked for him, because it was seven years for... Leah, seven years for Rachel, and then six years his wages were changed ten times. Okay, so just so you know, it was six years, and that's what I thought it was 20 years he was gone. But anyway, remember now, when he left, his dad was ancient, laying in a bed and couldn't move, and he thought, he, you know, his dad would be dead, and he obviously has word that his father is alive because it says return to your father and your father's house or whatever, but anyway, 20 years later, his dad has been laying in bed now all those years. That must have been a miserable existence, but anyway, okay, go ahead. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself. And you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or night. Okay, so there is another thing that Laban did. Not only did he change his wages, but he also accounted him. If somebody came and stole something, he'd say, well, you know, there's no proof that it was stolen. You could have had it for dinner last night, and so I'm charging you for that. And if anything was torn by an animal, which was common, you know, I'm sure it still is, then, you know, he bore the losses. So it wasn't just that he deceived him and became rich. He also bore losses but Laban, you know, he, he ended up not prospering because of the way that he handled the situation. And then verse 40 is great. Go ahead. This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night. And sleep fled from my eyes. I got to tell you, anybody that knows me, you all know I go to bed at 8.15. I love to sleep more than anything else in the world. I get to be handsome again when I sleep. And I think <laughs> this guy, can you imagine being out in the fields cold at night? You know, hot during the day. If you've ever been in the desert, have you all been to the desert? It gets very cold at night. As a matter of fact, in Nevada, it goes from like uh, 20 degrees up to 110 every day. 
I mean, it's amazing. That's like, what, a 90 or an 80 degree swing in a day. And out in the uh, the desert, and that's, you know, I mean, anytime you're in the desert, it gets very cold at night and super hot during the day. And he's just tired all the time. He wants to live his own life. He wants to go back home and have a, enjoy what he's earned. So, okay, go ahead. It was like this for 20 years. I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks. And you changed my wages 10 times. Once again, 10 times. So it's time of testing. It's The wages are changed. Okay, go ahead. 42. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would surely have sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands. And last night, he rebuked you. There you go. That's what I was saying earlier, is that he knows now that God rebuked Laban for all of the mistreatment that he had done on him. And last night, he called you to account for it. So, and I believe, I don't think that, let me see uh, real quickly uh, if I have a footnote on this. That's verse 42. And yeah, I think this is the first time that the term the fear of Isaac is mentioned. And I don't think we've seen that before. But anyway, that's a title of the name of God. And there are plenty of titles in the name of God. That's one of them, the fear of Isaac. Okay, 43. They've been answered, Jacob, the women are my daughters, the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks. All you see is mine. You know, he still can't give up on it. He says, they're my children, they're my grandchildren, these are my flocks. When he has rightfully earned all of these things, Laban can't let go of it. Yes, they were his originally, but he lost them through bad management. That's all there is to it. But he is still clinging on to the, the wealth that he thought he was going to get from this guy. So, okay. Yeah, what can I do today about these daughters of mine, or the children they have born? Come now, let's make a covenant, you and I. And let it serve as a witness between us. Okay, so the word witness here we're going to see in the next couple verses. But a witness is something that we will see throughout the Bible. But this is one of them right here. Go ahead. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. He said to his relatives, gather some stones. So they took stones and piled them in a heap. And they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jagar Sadahutha, which is Aramaic. That's the only Aramaic you're going to find in the book of Genesis. All right. And as I, I may have said it in this class, I may have said it last uh, Saturday, but um, there are only a few times in the Bible that Aramaic is used. This is the only time in Genesis you're going to see Aramaic. You're also going to see one verse in the book of Jeremiah. He's speaking, and right in the middle of a, a, a thought, one verse turns into Aramaic, and then he starts speaking Hebrew again. The book of Daniel, chapters 4, somewhere in 4 through chapter 7, are written in Aramaic. The book of Esther has some Aramaic in it. The book of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah have letters written in Aramaic, and parts of the uh, text are written in Aramaic. That's about it. There are a couple words later in the Bible, the colors of some of the things in the tabernacle, the purple and uh, linen, for example, the word is an Aramaic word rather than the Hebrew word, but there's very little Aramaic in the Bible. There's the first of it, and it's the only Aramaic that you're going to see in um, the book of Genesis. And what we have here, the Hebrew that we see today, when I write up on the wall in Hebrew, it's really bad handwriting, but that is Aramaic script. That's not Hebrew script. The Hebrew script is no longer used. When they were exiled <coughs> to Babylon, they adopted the Aramaic script for their Hebrew language. So we're reading in Hebrew, but we're reading Aramaic characters. It would be like us reading English in Greek characters instead of Roman characters. That would just be what it would be like. It's a different script, but it's the same language. So you have Hebrew and Aramaic, but the Bible that we have today is all written in Aramaic script, not in Hebrew script, okay? Just, just so you understand, the ancient Hebrew script was, they know what it is, but they don't use it at all today. Okay, go ahead. Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me today. That is why it was called Galid. Galid. It was also called Mitzvah, because he said, may the Lord keep watch between you and me when we are away from each other. Okay, so Jagar Sadahutha and Galid mean the same thing. They both mean a heap of witness. Okay? And um, let's see here, 49, mitzpah means to watch. And you'll see the term mitzpah used elsewhere in the Bible. 
mitzpah. I am watching. Where would that be? I, let me see if I, I, I I'm not going to have you go there because I don't think, nope, that's not the word I'm looking for. Anyway, so Jegar, Sadahutha, and Galid both mean one is in Aramaic, one is in Hebrew. Okay, but they mean the same thing. Mitzpah is Hebrew for watching. Okay, go ahead. If you mistreat my daughters or if you take any wives besides my daughters, even though no one is with us, remember that God is a witness between you and me. They are making a covenant between the two of them. And he's saying, I don't want you having any other wives except my wives. And God himself is going to be a witness. And now Jacob is going to agree to the terms. And so if he violates these terms, then he is bringing his own curse on himself. Okay, go ahead. Laban also said to Jacob, here is this heap. And here is the pillar I have set up between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness, that I will not go past this heap to your side to harm you, and that you will not go past this heap and pillar to my side to harm me. May the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob took an oath in the name of the fear of his father Isaac. Okay, so the funny thing is that he says the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor. And the God of Nahor is the father of Laban and Abraham, you know, or grandfather, whatever. So uh, they seem to understand that there's one God and yet they have all these other lesser gods around them. It's very hard for me to understand what these people were thinking at the time because he knew that this is the same God that is the God of Abraham and the God of Abraham's father Nahor who Laban comes from. See that? But he's got his own little gods on a shelf. So it's just, it, it's hard to understand. And, you know, even today, I hate to say it, you go onto like Facebook and there's people doing horoscopes when they say they're Christian. So, I mean, they got these little lesser gods all over the place. It really bothers me to see that because people are losing their focus on the one God and they're getting into these lesser gods, which are not gods at all. As, as the Bible so clearly makes um, uh, evident but they have this witness, and it says, I'm not going to go beyond this heap to you, and you're not going to go beyond this heap to me. And as I said, I think it was in this class, but it might not have been. I wonder, and I don't know this, I, I would wonder if that is still in effect today. In other words, these people made a covenant, and that covenant is binding on their generations. Is it binding today that the people of this land will not come and invade Israel and the people of Israel will not invade them? Israel never goes out and attacks anybody, but these people continuously come over them. Does God look at this ancient covenant and say, I am holding them to account for coming against Israel? Because they've done it four times in the past two weeks. They've gone over the border, they've gone in, they've attacked, and then the Jews go and shoot 20 of them, and the whole world gets mad at the Jews when they are violating the sovereignty of the Jewish nation from the land of Israel. So it, it's insane how this happens, but I don't know if, in fact, this is actually binding today or if this is something just between that generation. And I think these things, but I don't have an answer. Then I'm sure some people would say, oh, yes, it's binding today. It was an agreement made, and some people will say no. So I don't know the answer, but I think about that when I read this. But I do know that those people are violating the Israel sovereignty and they are being shot for it and then the world gets mad at the Jews and it makes no sense at all to me. They lob missiles over and they kill people in Israel. Israel re re uh, reacts, thank you, by going in and blowing them up and the world gets mad at Israel for defending themselves against bombs that were just sent in. They, I just don't understand it. The fulfillment of that scripture that says everything it's good, is seen as bad. That's right. Bad. That's Isaiah 118, I believe. Woe to them who see... Uh, let's read that. Sing how you brought it up. Good, good verse to bring up. And then we're going to finish this chapter. We're going to be done in just seconds. Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 118. I could be totally wrong on that. It could be Isaiah 22, 4. But 118... Uh, uh, no, well, it's right in there. might be in Isaiah 6. Woe to those... Oh, it is. It's in Isaiah 6. Hang on. Um, it's got to be. Um, it's right in that area, and it says here, no, it's not there either. It says, woe to those who's, um, hang on, it's right in this area. So it's a five. five, thank you. That's exactly what I said. How come you had me go to the wrong page? Okay, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Thank you, Ken, very good. 520, and that is exactly the way the world is today. 
Our president does it. Our Congress does it. It's just insane how people call evil good and good evil. You want to hear something that just makes me so angry is when I hear of a gay pride parade.